Thanks for coming, everyone. Good afternoon, Konnichiwa. So we're going to be talking about uh, some supply chain attacks and how we sort of defend against them. This is the huge issue, given a lot of recent sort of breaches and stuff. Uh, what can we do from a development point of view and a security point of view as well? Hopefully they meet in the middle somewhere. Um, so my name is Lawrence Crowther. I work for a company called Sneak, uh, which is helping developers build secure applications, their code, open source packages, uh, all their dependencies, containers, infrastructure as a code, things like Kubernetes configuration, etc. cetera. Um, hopefully catch stuff before you ship it to production, right? And uh, my background is mostly in software development, open source, the last sort of five years, um, spent time in application security as well. So let's get started. So yeah, I'll give you some background on uh, why we're we even having this conversation. Like what are the uh, shortcomings, I guess, of using open source and other sort of third party dependencies you have in the application, what, the, what are the risks? The different attack surfaces in your entire sort of pipeline uh, in sort of supply chain attacks, and then what can you do, go back to the office to uh, implement some of these techniques, right, to hopefully avoid some of the attacks. Make sense? So I think this talk is probably going to address two personas, developers, and probably somewhat like operators as well, but also the security audience. So I don't know where you sit, but hopefully there's something here for everyone. So I just want to start by, and hopefully most of you will know this, you know, the modern stack, right? Only the tip of the iceberg is actually the proprietary code that we develop. So that is the sort of business logic and the stuff that makes your uh, applications unique, right? Uh, but that is a very small portion of the actual overall application stack that gets deployed in production, right? Um, you know, 10 to 20 percent is sort of a average number there of, of custom code. 80 to 90 percent is actually the open source dependencies that you bring in, all right? And I'll give some examples which will explain this. When, and there's obviously a huge risk with those open source libraries. You know, where you download them from, who's the maintainers, uh, what is the sort of maintenance level of those packages, right? All these things you should consider before using them, right? There's an element of trust that you put in the upstream open source maintainers. Containers, obviously, uh, you know, developers are downloading those things, container-based images from Docker Hub and other places on the internet, which may contain hundreds of uh, vulnerabilities in Linux, different Linux distributions. So, uh, that, you know, developers are putting their companies at risk, you, you know, willy-nilly using different uh, container images. And then infrastructure as code as well. Probably it's still the number one cloud vulnerability. Uh, people, you know, leaving secrets, uh, exposing S3 buckets and stuff in your infrastructure as code, Terraform or Kubernetes configuration um, or cloud, cloud formation. Still a, you know, a big problem on the internet. So all of this to say really like it's not just code we have to worry about, right? There's all this other stuff. And so we said you know, 80% of code that gets deployed um, is open source. And you know, in the last three years, vulnerabilities in open source packages have increased almost three times. 78% of vulnerabilities are found in what's called transient or indirect dependencies. So that is the libraries that uh, get dragged in when developers choose the, the packages they want. They themselves have interdependencies with other packages, right? And they all get dragged in. And that's where sort of the unknown, unknown is. That's where most of the vulnerabilities are. So let me give you an example. This small uh, application, a to-do application in Spring Boot, basically uh, has three files, OK? 
okay? A very small application, 80 lines of code. It has, on the right-hand side there, you can see seven direct dependencies. You can see them defined there in the pom.xml. Those seven directories, sorry, dependencies have uh, 59 indirect dependencies. So let's call it a total of 66 dependencies. I think the next number is what you'll find staggering, the actual lines of code that get deployed to production. And this is, you know, developers might not be aware of this, right? You want to have a guess how much, how many lines of code? Just take a wild guess, anyone? 150. 150 lines of code or 150,000? 150,000? Ooh, getting close. 713,000 lines of code. Just put that in, just think about that for a sec. Most of the code that gets deployed has not been written by your own developers, right? We don't even know where it came from. And it's running in our production servers. So this is um, something to think about, right? When you put it in that perspective. This meme sort of sums it up as well, right? <laughs> I don't think developers are really aware of what's going to happen when they do a build, or npm install, or maybe an install, whatever you're using. Um, but it's going to download all this stuff, execute code actually, because obviously you can run tasks as part of the build process, right? Whoops. And yeah, you just hope for the best when you press that button. <laughs> So installing an average NPM package um, has 79 third-party dependencies from um, 39 maintainers on average, right? Which is a massive sort of attack surface. So the question is, who, who do you trust, right? Do you trust your own developers? Do you trust the open source developers? Um, it, you know, we don't know is the answer. I found this um, pretty cool tool, NPM Graph. I don't know if you've seen it. Hopefully I can click on this link and it'll work. But essentially, yeah. You put in a um, package name, in this case, Express, which is a you know, popular web framework for Node. And it starts to build out all the dependencies. It's a little bit slow, I had it run over here. So 78 dependencies, 78 nodes of this thing. More than 100 maintainers and dozens of different open source licenses, right? So the lawyers would be very nervous about this. And different versions of each package as well. So it's not just 78 um, uh, dependencies. Some of those are the same library, but different versions, which causes a lot of conflict when you, you do your builds, right? So as you can see, obviously, quite a complex issue to solve. And there's plenty of opportunities for you know, would-be attackers to trick developers, actually, to downloading malicious code, okay? which we'll, we'll talk about. So this, yeah, so we'll talk about it now. So um, the typical supply chain across the whole SDLC pipeline. I'm going to touch on a couple of different attack opportunities, I guess, for hackers or malicious actors, I should say. So first, libraries. There's something called dependency confusion. Don't know if you've heard of this, but this is essentially um, tricking the developer to download a public version of an internal library. So I'll explain. So there's, there's this researcher called Alex Burson who was successfully hacked into Apple and Microsoft and about 30 other companies. Um, Spotify, I think, was another one. Luckily, he was not a uh, bad actor, he was wanting to collect bug bounties. I think he got 100k for his effort, but he discovered some fundamental flaws in NPM uh, Node Package Manager and Python PIP Package Manager, where if you use the same name for a uh, library, if you have an internal name and you host it in a public domain, those package managers would favor the public version instead. Same name, same version it will then download those packages to the developer's machine. And he um, created a re remote code execution vulnerability and was able to spy on the developers, right? 
just to prove the, uh, to pr prove the point. You can Google it, it's pretty well known, dependency confusion. Similar, the other one is called typo squatting. This is the hosting different permutations of the spelling of a, a library. So in the hope that developers actually misspell and have, or have a typo and inadvertently download a malicious package. Okay? Um, you might have you know, express with three S's instead of two, right? Which then would download this package. It does exactly the same thing as express with the little hidden malicious code as well, right? Make sense? Containers, obviously a big attack surface as well. Uh, one example I'll give there is in um, Azure, something called Kubeflow, which is a framework for uh, deploying machine learning jobs on Kubernetes, okay, uh, using TensorFlow. And attackers were able to submit crypto mining jobs into those clusters through some clever tunneling techniques, got access to the, the dashboard to submit the jobs. The interesting part about this attack is that they used the same base image as the machine learning jobs, so uh, TensorFlow image from Docker Hub. So it looked the same, runtime. And also it had the same characteristics as the machine learning jobs, it had high CPU, high memory usage, which is exactly the same profile as the machine learning jobs. So they actually got away with it for up to six months running these crypto mining jobs right, until it was noticed. So I thought that was quite interesting. I said before, developers themselves can be tricked. This is the case here. North Korea was working with a bunch of security researchers on some vulnerability data. And through you know, social engineering, they, well, they may, first of all, they maintained, they got trust with the engineers um, and they were you know, working on some legitimate projects, what have you. But then they got them to download a new Visual Studio project, which had a hidden DLL which executed during the build process, which opened up a command and control instance and North Korea was spying on these um, security engineers, right? So moving on to like CI, CD. So obviously you use a lot of third party plugins in CI, CD or, or um, open source tools inside there for your build process or testing, what have you. And um, as the case here, there's a company called CodeCov. I don't know if you heard of it. It's a code coverage SaaS service used by thousands of developers to specifically test how much, uh, sorry, specifically scan to see how much test coverage you have in your code before deploying to production, right? You want to get sort of above 80% or what have you. Used by, you know, high profile companies like HashCorp, Confluent, etc. Anyway, um, the attackers got access through a, a bash script that they, through um, an S3 bucket and were able to change one line of bash script to send the code cobs customers credentials in their CI CD pipelines. Think about that for a sec. That's the crown jewels, all their secret keys and passwords to their internal systems were then sent back to the hacker's site, right? So they collect mined all this, uh, all this data. I think that was in 2022, I think. And obviously the most famous one is SolarWinds, um, which as you'll see later, kicked off a lot of the work around supply chain security. But in that one, credentials were exposed, they got in through a build system, and were able to slip in the malicious code into the package that then got distributed to SolarWinds end customers, right? And that's sort of their main objective. In the, both the CodeCov and the SolarWinds one, their primary goal was not just to hack the vendor, obviously, but hack the vendor's customers. So call that cascading attack. And in the case of SolarWinds, 18,000 customers and several US federal government agencies as well, as well, right? So you can see, I'm starting to build a picture here. It's very complex and opaque, because it's opaque. We don't know where this stuff is coming from. Right, um, there is that sort of reliance on, on trust. And if you have a weak link anywhere in your supply chain, like the example I gave there, you know, a, a credential was exposed, I got in through a build system, attackers will find it. None of this, we haven't actually talked about 
hacking a website or production or whatever. This is all before that, right? Yeah, so developers can be a vehicle for malware distribution, meaning knowingly or unknowingly, uh, that there have been cases where a, a disgruntled developer has um, purposely put in malicious code. I think, uh, do you remember the, um, as part of the Amazon uh, CDK, they, were, they were, it used a library called Colors, which all it did really was allow you to highlight different colors in a command line prompt. A lot of different tools use, uh, to use that, including Amazon CDK. He was totally fed up with these big companies like Amazon using open source and not contributing back. So you put like an infinite for loop in the code and it crashed anyone who used uh, the CDK, which is in a lot of customers' critical pipelines, right? And so that, you know, internet broke for a day or so because of that. But that was an example of, you know, developers doing it on purpose. Most of the time, I think developers are unaware, right? As the examples I gave with the typo squatting, dependency confusion, et cetera. A few more examples here. There was something called the Sour Mint malware. Actually, my company, Sneak, uh, led the research on this one. This is from a Chinese mobile advertising company called Mintegral SDK. It's, um, it's used by thousands of applications uh, for marketing attribution to monitor the clicks for ads, et cetera, both iOS and Android. Downlo billions of downloads of users. So we're talking standard apps that you and I use, right, from the app store. You've probably used this, right? This is an example of um, a uh, targeted attack, I would say, because what we found, what the research found is that it was hooked into low-level system APIs on the phone, uh, which is not usually that common, right? You normally use the proper SDKs and what have you. You don't sort of need to go down to low-level stuff. It was intercepting all HTTP requests and uh, siphoning that off to the integral servers. Um, and it also opened up a backdoor as well so that Mintegral could spy on the devices, right? So pretty, pretty bad. Um, if you can, do, you can Google it and, and read more about it, but that was quite an interesting one. This one is quite famous as well, the event stream incident. It's quite a while ago, 2018, but I think it's worth mentioning because it was kind of the, the, the first big supply chain attack in the JavaScript ecosystem, okay? Um, you know, EventStream is a very popular library for handling streams. And um, what it did was uh, decrypt itself in a specific application called Copay, which is a Bitcoin cryptocurrency wallet. Ultimately stole Bitcoins from unsuspecting customers. It's worth going through the sort of event timeline here because um, a lot of these attacks uh, takes several years, in fact. I, I don't have it here, but there's another one, the X, XZ utils attack in Linux uh, earlier this year. I think that was a three-year attack where they got the trust of the maintainers and over time put in the malicious code, right? Similar to this one in that, you know, I mean, this, this library's been around for a long time, since 2011, I think. Um, and there wasn't that much activity in the, in the repository uh, up until, you know, sort of two years before the incident. But then someone shows up unexpectedly on the GitHub um, repo, adding pull requests, wanting to help, right? Adding fixes and new functionality, which obviously is fine. It's customary and open source. So we built up their trust over, you know, a year period where then got more and more access or more um, permissions to commit directly to the repo, et cetera, uh, and then introduced some dependencies into the event stream project, which still looked legitimate, but over time you know, added some malicious code in one of the dependencies with a subsequent pull request, um, which then, you know, was able to, in the context of this copay app only, um, decrypt itself and actually steal the Bitcoin. So 
it would it was in stealth mode for other types of environments. This event stream thing is used for all sorts of stuff, right? All sorts of web websites and applications, but it only activated itself in this one app, right? So the, 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 the attackers knew exactly what they wanted to do. The end game was to attack this particular app. This is slightly different to the other examples, the cascading ones where the supply chain, we, you use you know, a vendor to get malware to the thousands of customers, right? This one was more targeted on a specific application. See the difference? Um, yeah, but it's, a lot of these things happen the same way where the trust is, I mean, it could be nation state, I don't know, but um, a lot of these uh, attackers are sort of playing the long game, right? So the, you know, the supply chain sort of affects everyone, it impacts everyone, can we, what can we do to help get ahead of this stuff. So you, you may have heard of SBOM, Software Bill of Materials, which was sort of in response to the uh, solar winds and other things like log for shell that happened around the same time, uh, other um, attacks that I talked about. The National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, part of the US federal government, put out the cybersecurity order. And at least you know at the time, for companies working or contracting to the government, they need to uh, use the SBOM standard. Um, and th there's two standards actually, SPDX, which is from the Linux Foundation, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and Cyclone DX, which is from the OWASP Foundation. I think SPDX is probably the most popular one as we speak, but both of them are quite good. Um, basically, if you haven't heard of this stuff, it's machine readable uh, file, configura configuration file that lists all the dependencies. Um, things like open source license usage as well. So particularly important in sort of critical infrastructure development, automotive, what have you, that you need for compliance to know exactly what's going into the vehicle. Um, so you can export these SBOMs or you can ingest these SBOMs from other third parties as well, right? So this is, this is definitely going to help. Some other things to call out. Um, across the stack and how you would secure your, your pipelines. For your open source dependencies, use something called SCA tool, Software Composition Analysis, to scan all the dependencies across the um, software development lifecycle. Um, hopefully you can, developers can use that in their IDE, but if not, you know, and you, of course, there's zero day vulnerabilities that pop up as well. Other places in the SDLC, like your Git repository or CI CD. Containers, you want to be scanning the actual Docker file configuration from, um, by looking at the base image before you actually build the container. So what vulnerabilities are in that base image? And then once the con container gets built, gets deployed to a registry, you can um, integrate with the registry and scan it there as well. We talked about SBOM. Infrastructure as code, so the scanning all the misconfigurations. Um, again, hopefully from IDE, but you know, along the whole SDLC as well. Um, looking for drift as well, like I have my um, defined state, my actual state, are they different in the cloud? Custom code, use a SAS tool, uh, software uh, application security testing tool that's going to scan the, the first party proprietary code. And then you, it may be the same product or a different thing, but something that's going to, to um, look for secrets and secret keys and credentials and that's not just in code. It could be in your infrastructure's code files, like Terraform files, what have you. Could also be in just like text files or property files laying in the repo as well, right? And you can do some interesting things there like push protection and um, hook into the pull requests to prevent secrets actually getting into the repo in the first place. Make sense? That's all I had for you. Um, Sneak has, this white paper you might find interesting, software supply chain security. If you go to this QR code, um, you'll find it, and, and also the eight best practices for securing your supply chain. Most of the stuff uh, I, I talked about, there's probably some other details there, but any questions? I think I'm pretty good for time, yeah. About five minutes, yeah, go ahead.
Yeah, thank you very much. I think all of these recommendations are good ones, but the problem that I see is that they probably would not really help against the issues that you showed. So even if I would do all of that, then I could still run into a situation like except where I have a trusted contributor building up trust over time, yeah, yeah. and then adding some malicious code. So it's a good question. What is your perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, I think any good SCA tool will behind the tool there'll be a security research team. We have, we have a security research team, for example, that is sort of tracking this stuff, right? So as as quickly as it's sort of disclosed, we tag the, the, the database, so then we mark that sort of package as malicious, right? Um, but you're right, like that zero day thing, you know, obviously we can't detect that straight away um, unless you know of a way. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Yeah. I mean, we, we do a lot of code review, but it just does not scale. I mean, a good code reviewer can have a look at so much code during the day, yeah. and just the code churn is so high, it's next to impossible to do something. And even automation yeah. does not really help because attackers also have this automation, and then I can just work around that. So I think what I would say there is like, OK, you might not catch the issue when the developer has downloaded the package, right, when they start using it, but hopefully, before you get to production. Like if you're, that's why it's super important to scan in all the places, IDE, GitHub, CI, CD. Hopefully you catch it somewhere before production, right? Or at least have a process, if, even if you do find it in production, be able to sort of remediate it fast, right? Yeah, but you know, good point. Any other questions? You're a shy bunch. <laughs> Or, or comments? Yes. Uh, thank, thank you for the presentation. Uh, the, you suggested uh, uh, several uh, things to do. Um, uh, do you think that everything should be done in the every every software in the uh, system, for example, uh, of course, if it's the container, it's, it can be minimize the uh, risk, but uh, for example, uh, embedded system or such thing, uh, if it's a Linux system, uh, even it's embedded system, it can be included many softwares and uh, how do you think uh, covering every software are you talking about like packaged applications or third-party components that you're using yeah, as well? Uh, uh, yeah, or that's or, that's yeah. the S-bomb, I think. Uh -huh. Make sure your vendors give you an S-bomb mm -hmm. and you scan that. I see. Yeah, and, and put that as part of your build process, the uh, pipeline. Okay, so uh, it means uh, the such, uh, for example, the dis distribution, the distribution vendor should give the uh, have, have the responsibility about the doing such things. Yeah, but I mean, but prove it by giving you an S-bomb, which defines all the dependencies so that you can scan that uh -huh. for any known vulnerabilities, uh -huh. right? And just make a decision whether you should deploy that or not. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? How are we going? One minute. Anything else? I'll, I'll hang around if you have questions anyway. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.